I'm telling. I'm telling. Hey, what you doing, man? I'm telling. I'm calling call you. This is your time to get it off your chest. Whether you're mad or blessed. 800-585-1051. We want to hear from you on The Breakfast Club. <laughs> Hello, who's this? Hey, it's Justin Cameron from Orlando. Hey, Justice, what's up? Get it off your chest. What's up, man? I'm just calling because, um, you know, every time I open up Instagram, I'm seeing uh, more and more rappers being killed. And um, now I'm opening up Instagram. I'm seeing that take off a shot and killed in Houston over a dice game. I mean, we can't confirm any of that yet. I mean, and, and um, you know, the brother has family, parents, friends, and all that. Yeah. So we can't confirm anything until... The news confirmed, but you know we've been we, hearing you know, similar, we're hearing similar the same. We hearing the same thing y'all hearing similar reports, but like you said, we just don't want to confirm yeah, or deny man. anything until you know, until it's made public yeah. or whatever. You know, for sure. Yeah, it's crazy, man. You know, every time you know I, I'm open up Instagram and I'm seeing more and more rappers, man. More and more rappers. I and see. I, I, yeah, it is more and more rappers, but I see more, more and more people. people. Yeah, you know, and that's that's like I see more and more yeah. people. It's, this is very dark times that we in right now, all all over the world. Mm. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Right. Now, you know, everybody just really got to stay protected and follow God, man. I agree. You so know, um, stay blessed up. Be safe out there, bro. Um, you see how it is out here? Absolutely. It's only getting worse. All right, all right. Be safe out there, brother. Have a good day. Hello, who's this? Good morning, Scott. How you doing? How you feeling this peace, morning, brother? Peace, King. I'm good. I'm on my way into work right now. About to do a 10-hour shift. Where you from? God Yo, bless. Uh, I'm in uh I'm in Clarksville right now, DJ Anthony. I was asking about your uh, car show a couple months back. I was trying to figure out, uh, do the tickets go straight to the venue? Because I never got like an email. I never got anything. I want to make sure I attend this. Uh, how did you get tickets, sir? I called in maybe back back in September and asked you for them. Told you about my okay, kid. Okay, yep, yep, wife. yep, yep. You're good. So uh, all you got to do is say your name. We have your your first your first name and last name, and you have a family four pack. Your tickets will be okay. at the door. So all you got to do is go to the front. Your name will be on the list at the front door, brother. Okay. Hey, I appreciate it, man. You guys have a good day. And that's November 27th. Get there early. The doors open up at 12, but uh, all uh, winners and VIP get there at 11 so you guys can, you know, get a chance to walk and step in the cars and all that other stuff. Okay. Appreciate it. All right, brother. See you there. All right. See you, sir. And that's November 27th. My car shows in Huntsville, Alabama, the Vaughn Braun Center. Kids five and under are free. If you haven't got your tickets, definitely get your tickets. We have a lot of fun that day. But get it off your chest. 800-585-1051. If you need to vent, hit us up now. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. The Breakfast Club. Pure Podcast. Power 1051. The Breakfast Club. Envy, Angela Yee, and Charlemagne the God. This is your time to get it off your chest. Whether you're man or blessed. We want to hear from you on The Breakfast Club. So if you got something on your mind, let it out. Hello, who's this? Hey, this is Tony. Hey, Tony. What's up, Evie? What's up, brother? Man, not much. What up, Charlotte, man? Peace, King. How you doing, black man? Man, I'm doing all right. What's going on, you? Good morning. How are you? I'm good. I'm doing pretty good. But nothing, man, just wanted to give y'all a shout out. I want to ask uh, Charlamagne when he coming back to Milwaukee. Oh, uh, man, you know I love Milwaukee. I don't know. I don't have anything for uh, uh, with Milwaukee on the schedule no time soon. But, you know, I got I got mad love for Milwaukee. Love Milwaukee. That's the first city to ever syndicate the Breakfast Club. Salute to Bailey. Uh, she's not at B100.7. Yeah, yeah. But salute to Bailey, Bailey Coleman. Man, I, I salute y'all, man. Just love what y'all do, man. Just up feeling good this morning. Yes, right, sir. Brother, love to you. Before. We appreciate that energy, brother. Hello, who's this? Hi, this is Nikki. Hey, Nikki, good morning. Get it off your chest. Hey, good morning, guys. Um, first of all, I love you guys. Thank you. We love you, too. We love you more. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I called last year and talked about some stuff, but today, really, I didn't have anything to get off my chest. I just, he was like, the guy who answered the phone, he was like, what you got? And I was like, really nothing. I just wanted to say um, congratulations to you on um, your new Venture. Thank you. I'm starting to question um, that new venture. I don't I don't know if that new venture is happening. She's still here, yo. Listen. I believe it when I see it. I cannot wait. Yeah, this is a lot. They got I feel like I'm working two jobs right now because they got me doing a bunch of stuff for this new show, but then being here too. But you know, it's a grind. I'm gonna be honest with you, this new show starting to sound like Tommy <laughs> Job off Martin, yo. I'm not sure if it really, I'm, I'm not sure if it really exists. What do you think, Envy? I'm with you, man. She's supposed to be out of here a long, a long time, time ago. ago. Listen, I've been like, come on, y'all, let me go. But I'm here. Oh, well, y'all y'all just blessed to have her a little bit longer. But what I was going to say is, Charlamagne, you know I love you. You know they say what they want to say, but I message 
you. Envy, I love you too. I love you. And better. I love what you're doing, you know, with the um the uh, housing and stuff like that. Yes, but what I was gonna say, ye, I'm uh, in Indiana. If you ever come to Indiana, mm-hmm. look me up. I got you free. Don't know. Uh if you want your makeup done. Ah, I'm okay. Good. Yep. Well, send me your DM. Instagram. I always need oh, your Instagram. Yeah, what's your Instagram? Okay. My Instagram is uh, Lanique, L-A-N-I-Q Cosmetic. L-A-N-I-Q Cosmetic. Okay. Yep. Look me up. So if you ever in the night town and want to get something done, let me know. I got you. And if I can't do it, I got people that can do it. If I can't do it. Okay, I see you here. Okay, <laughs> Lanique. Yeah, okay. good morning, mama. Okay. Goodbye. All right, get it off your chest, 800-585-1051. If you need to vent, you can hit us up. Now we got rumors on the way? Yes, and we have an unfortunate rumor to report this morning. We'll tell you what is being said online. I know a lot of you see this trending as you're waking up, so we'll tell you what is being said. Um, You know, these are always uh, touchy situations for us to report on as we're still waiting to get official confirmation, but let's discuss. All right, we'll get into it next. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. The Breakfast Club. It's time, time, time. She's spilling the tea. This is the Rumor Report with Angela Yee on The Breakfast Club. Well, we did see multiple reports on social media, and out of respect for Takeoff's family and close friends, you know, we are putting this in the rumor report. It has not been officially confirmed by family members, but multiple Houston promoters are claiming that they allegedly saw a takeoff get shot and killed in an event. This is according to Say Cheese TV. And here is a report from Lieutenant R. Wilkins from the Houston Police Department discussing an incident that did happen, although he did not name who the victim was. Hey, we're here at uh, in between Dallas and Polk on San Jacinto. Uh, we got one male that's deceased. He's right in front of uh, the 810 Bowling Alley, uh, which is on the third floor. Looks like he's been shot in the head or neck, possibly. Right now, we don't have a whole lot of information. We know it happened somewhere around 2.35. Uh, there were some security guards that were in the area, but they heard the shooting, but no one saw who did the shooting. Um, a lot of folks were there. They were in front of the bar. The bar was actually closed at the time. They had the doors locked, but people were congregating out on the balcony area. and. Everybody fled. We've got some video footage, but not very well. Everybody fled. Homicide investigators are coming. It would be great if anybody would come forward and tell us what occurred, because right now we really don't have a whole lot of anything. Well, TMZ has confirmed. I don't know if that matters, but yeah, TMZ has confirmed. All those people and nobody saw nothing? Is that what the officer said? That's what the police officer said. I think they're still waiting for people to come forward and give information. Exactly. It should be they didn't say anything. Right. Yeah, yeah, and that doesn't mean that they won't. You know, there's video footage and I'm sure they're still gathering information as mm-hmm. this was just a couple of hours ago. Yeah. They not only, you know, uh, do I hope they do, they should, because, you know, a human that'll do that in a bowling alley in front of all those people. You think he Pack would have people. any remorse for you? You think he'd have any remorse for one of your loved ones? And there were false reports before that that Quavo was shot as well, but he was not shot. He's fine. He was there, though. Yes. All I mean, right. I mean, there's nothing, you know. I can say right now that doesn't sound like I'm reading off the same old script. Condolences you know? to Condolences his, families, his family, his friends. It's you know, it's rest in peace. It's just very sad. And I would say don't you know I, I don't very call sad. him just a rapper though. You know more, that was a that was a black man. He was a human. He has family that loves him and cares about him. And you know they don't call him takeoff. And the media will say rapper takeoff shot and killed, but that's someone's family. And that man's family is waking up this morning, seeing the news online, hearing mm-hmm. it on the radio. Just think of that when you're. You know, reporting on this story today. And Girl, nobody wants 20. to see the pictures and the Eight. videos that everybody's, uh, you know, I see that some people had some pictures on the scene. Like, mm-hmm. okay, calm down, everybody. That's, I think, disrespectful Man. to be posting things like that. 28 years old. The brother didn't even get to see 30. That is so freaking sad, man. 28. Uh, all right, well, we will keep on updating you as news is coming in. Hopefully there will be <sighs> some information shortly on who was involved in this. All right, Albie Shore was hospitalized in a coma for two months. And in a post that was shared on social media, Albie Shore Jr. was thanking a lot of people for the birthday wishes he got on his Instagram page. But he also did update his fans and followers on the current status of what's going on. Um, He said his father, musician Albie Shore, had been hospitalized in a coma and he shared a series of photos of himself along with images of him and his dad. He said, thank you for everyone for the birthday wishes. Been kind of out of it and in my own world. 
<sighs> Pop's been hospitalized for two months and he just made it out. So I'm much better and ready to get back on my ish. It's time to get the F up, Pop. We got ish to do and countries to visit. Thank you for all the concerns and worries about my family. Today is my day, but this is for my Pops. All I want for him is to get out that F in hospital. Yeah, sending healing energy to I'll be sure for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so grateful that he's still. Uh, I didn't even know that he was hospitalized for two months. Mm -mm. All right, now Kodak Black is not happy with the first week sales projections for Cutthroat Bill Volume 1. He posted still a win, but my album just came out two days ago and today's a Sunday. It's no way an MF can project it's only selling 39,000. My is too fire to sell only that. I guarantee it sells more. Also, the streaming system been effed up lately. This ish ain't used to be like this back then. Either way, I go. It's still a W. All right, so he still has some time. He said it's only Sunday, mm -hmm. but it is projections. I guess normally they could tell what your album's going to sell. They're usually pretty on point. Usually from the pre-sales and first day buys. Well, I can't sit here and act like that album was really great, greatly promoted because I'm I like Kodak Black, but I didn't hear about the album until Angela Lee said it was coming out in Rumor Report on Friday. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know. All right, A Boogie with the hoodie has delayed his album release. He's not trying to compete with Drake and Twenty One Savage. He says sorry, but album dropping in December now. Drake was dropping the same day, and I'm not with that. <laughs> Smart move. Uh, and then he put some laughing emojis on his <laughs> Instagram story. So he's trying to get that number one album, and, and so he's like, probably not the best idea. Correct. And they pushed their album back. So I'm sure he thought he was all clear, but then they pushed it back, so now he's pushing his back. All right? And that was because, remember, um, uh, 40 got, got COVID. Correct. All right, and that is your rumor reports. All right. We got front page news next. What are we talking about? Yes, let's talk about Nancy Pelosi and her husband. Uh, now, there's more reports about what happened actually at her home when her husband, Paul Pelosi, was attacked. And they do have the person who has been charged with a bunch of different crimes. He's facing up to 50 years in prison. We'll tell you what was said during that attack. All right, we'll get to that next. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. The Breakfast Club. Your mornings will never be the same. You might not have the biggest garage on the block, but with eBay Motors, there's 122 million parts right at your fingertips. Whatever you need, there's something that fits your vehicle. Air filters, tires, seat covers, and more. Get the right parts at the right prices. eBayMotors.com, let's ride. Envy, Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy, we are The Breakfast Club. Let's get into some front page news. Now, Monday Night Football, the Browns beat the Bengals last night, 32-13. to 13. Now, what else we got, Yeezy? All right, well, let's talk about Paul Pelosi, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband. He is making steady progress on what they are saying will be a long recovery process. He was attacked at his home early Friday. And the person that has been charged with a bunch of different crimes, including assault, attempted murder, and attempted kidnapping following that break-in at their house in San Francisco, is David DePate. He is 42 years old. He was charged with one count of attempted kidnapping of a U.S. official. That charge carries a maximum of 20 years in prison. He was also charged with one count of assault of an immediate family member of a U.S. official with the intent to retaliate against the official. That charge relates to a crime committed against Paul Pelosi and carries a maximum sentence of 30 years in prison. So imagine you're at home and somebody just breaks into your home and attacks you for no reason. Now, Pelosi stated that uh, there was a male in the home and that the male is, was going to wait for a Pelosi's wife and further convey that he does not know who the male is. The male said his name is David, according to an FBI agent uh, that said that was said in a sworn affidavit. Paul Pelosi called 911 and police arrived at the house eight minutes later when the door was open. Pelosi and DePape were both holding a hammer with one hand. Um, and DePape had his other hand holding on to Pelosi's forearm. He greeted the officers. They asked what was going on, and DePape responded that everything was good. And then they asked him to drop the hammer. And that's when DePape allegedly pulled the hammer away and swung it, striking Paul Pelosi in the head. And that's when Paul Pelosi appeared to be unconscious on the ground. After that blow, he was later taken to the hospital, underwent a successful surgery to repair a skull fracture and serious injuries to his right arm and hands. They expect him to make a full recovery. I don't understand why the Speaker of the House wouldn't constantly have security, no matter you know where she is. I know she wasn't in D.C. at the time. They were at their crib in San Francisco. But why wouldn't they have Secret Service? Like She's the second in line for the presidency. If something mm -hmm. happens to the president, then the vice president becomes president. But the vice president, something happens to the vice president, then Speaker Nancy Pelosi becomes president. So why wouldn't that person have constant 24-7 secret service security? She probably, she does. No, she doesn't. What are you talking about? She does. Her husband doesn't. It's still her house. 
You still have it around our crib. Like, why wouldn't you? Now, DePape confessed in an interview with local police. He intended to find the house speaker and hold her hostage. He said he was going to hold her hostage and talk to her. And if she were to tell DePape the truth, he would let her go. And if she lied, he was going to break her kneecaps. So that's a very scary thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, grateful that he is okay. What's interesting about that guy, too, is that his blog had a bunch of, like, right-leaning conspiracy theories on Mm -hmm. it. But he was previously affiliated with a bunch of left-leaning causes. You know, so it's just interesting how, like, uh, we live in a world where Mm -hmm. people believe conspiracy theories more than reality. And those conspiracy theories change people's reality. Mm. All right. Now, Tom Brady was asked about handling, dealing with his... With football, but also with his divorce at the same time. He was on Let's Go with Jim Gray. Um, And here's what he had to say about things that are going on at work and things that are going on at home. Tommy, there's an awful lot going on in your life away from the football field. It's created, I'm sure, a number of challenges for you this season. Yeah, Jim. You know, I think there's a lot of professionals in life that go through things that they deal with at work and they deal with at home. And Obviously, the good news is things. That it's a very amicable situation, and I'm really focused on two things: and taking care of my family, and certainly my children. And secondly, doing the best job I can to win football games. So that's what professionals do: you focus at work when it's time to work, and then when you come home, you focus on the priorities that are at home. And all you can do is the best you could do, and that's what I'll just continue to do as long as I'm working and as long as I'm being a dad. Work-life balance, right? Everybody has a you know a different way to. to everybody has different work-life balance, right? Uh-huh. But Tom Brady too old to be trying to find work-life balance. You've been in the NFL for a hundred years. You're seventy-three years old. Should be a wrap for you as far as work is concerned. At least that type of work. Yeah, <laughs> you know but you, I mean? you know what though is 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 he he decides when his when he's finished working. You know what I mean? He still has love for the game. He still wants to play. So that's that's his. That's how he feels. That's yeah. how he wants to end his career. I get it, but you you. you He's, he's what is he? Forty five. He's forty five. Been he in the league twenty in years. You got yeah. seven Super Bowls. You've been to the Super Bowl ten times. You got more Super Bowls than every NFL franchise. Yeah, but that's <laughs> like that's, that's not his fulfillment. His fulfillment is he might want to play a couple of extra years. Like you know, what I mean, everybody's life journey is different. Yeah, he always said he was going to play till he was forty five. But you can understand why if you do announce your retirement, you know, and your wife probably gets happy. And right. then, you know, you go back after two months, you can see where she'd probably be and there's feeling a lo- away. There's mm-hmm. a lot of reports about what's going on behind the scenes. And they said he did try to salvage his marriage, but it was too little too late, according and, to reports. Yeah. It just sounded like in that clip, he's trying to find a proper work-life balance. But I'm just like, his situation is a little bit different because he's been working for a long, 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 long time. He's, he's one of those people that people are like, why are you still working? Because he still enjoys it. All right. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's totally different. Like, you know, why, why do you work? Why do you still do this? Why are you playing football? Because he still enjoys it. That's his enjoyment. That's what it, that's what he gets out of life. He's 45, that's what makes him happy. So what? He might get hurt. He might get hurt, but that's what he likes. And it's been looking like that the past few weeks. Like, whoa. All right, Tom. Just you like might need these, time. You might need to hang it up, brother. Just like people talk about Floyd Mayweather. You know what I mean? He's still boxing. And people say, no, well, no, 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 no. He can still get no, hurt. No, he, he can't no. get hurt. Floyd is doing exhibition matches, but, sir. So you can't get hurt no. in exhibition? Not like that. Yes, they're, not, they're not even banging like that. Stop, NBA. It no. takes one punch. Yes, no. absolutely. These young boys is out there hitting Tom Brady with all they got. You can still, not doing that. You can still get And Floyd regardless. over there fighting little Japanese people that don't even box. They like karate people. They, he's he's so, in there owning them. What does that mean? And he said himself, he I'm not putting swing. myself in no position that's going to cause me to get hurt. You Bro, think Floyd ain't out there really taking no punch? Stop, punch man. Stop, can put stop, Floyd on stop, his stop. ass. Stop. Absolutely. He's not fighting nobody that can do that to him. Stop. Yes, it, what, what you no. mean? These, they, they're still fighting. No. And he's, these guys he, are still no. fighting. They're he, fighters. Listen, he said it himself. He knows what he's doing, NB. Stop. Yeah, Knock it off. These guys are fighters, though. At the end of the no. day, I don't care if they do karate, no. if they do UFC, if they no. do fungal, do, it no. doesn't matter. Tom Brady is in a much more dangerous position it's all dangerous. every Sunday. They, than but Floyd sometimes Mayweather's. people do sacrifice their home life for their work life. That is the or, question. This or vice versa. All right. So what are we asking? What's how, the balance? Yeah. How do you? What, what, is, what does your work life balance look like? 800-585-1051. Let's discuss this. The Breakfast Club. Good morning. The Breakfast Club. Call 800-585-1051 to join into the discussion with The Breakfast Club. Let's talk about it. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. If you're just joining us, we're talking about uh, work-life balance. Now, this conversation comes from Tom Brady. He was talking about our work-life balances of 
You know, him and his wife are, are getting a divorce. Let's listen to the audio. You know, I think there's a lot of professionals in life that go through things that they deal with at work and they deal with at home. And obviously the good news is things that it's a very amicable situation. And I'm really focused on two things and taking care of my family and certainly my children. And secondly, doing the best job I can to win football games. So that's what professionals do. You focus at work when it's time to work. And then when you come home, you focus on the priorities that are at home and all you can do is the best you could do. And that's what I'll just continue to do as long as I'm working and as long as I'm being a dad. So we're asking 800 585 1051 We're talking work-life balance. Uh, my work-life balance is, is kind of horrible. Uh, really? Yeah, I always, uh, I'm thankful and grateful to my wife who pretty much uh, maintains the house. Uh, you know, we always say that the, your wife is the CEO of your house and she's mm -hmm. the CEO of my life. But, you know, it's coming from where we come and, and having so many kids. I'm trying to set up a future for my kids and, and their kids and their kids' kids. And sometimes that takes a lot of work. Um, I, I slow down a lot, but on the weekends, I do got to move and I do got to fly a lot. I make sure I fly back for my kids' events and back and forth. But, you know, it's it's trying to set up something so my kids will have a future and they never have to do anything they don't want to do. That That's what I try to set up for my family and my kids. So work-life balance is difficult, but my wife picks up the slack and she doesn't have a problem doing it. But if she did, I don't, I don't, I don't know what would happen at that point, you know? I feel like I work a lot, but what I try to do is incorporate like work into and make it fun. So I might like tell my boyfriend, meet me here. Or we'll go here. You come with me. We'll make it into a vacation. We'll stay. Yeah, extra I do that day. with my kids all the time. My family all the time. Absolutely. You know things like that. And then I did have to learn to start saying no to things. Yep. Because I feel like I work too much, and so sometimes you do have to. I, I've always put work above everything, though. Yeah, I have a great work-life balance because I have work and I have life. You know, when people say life, my only life is being a father and husband. So when I'm not at work, I'm home, which is why I like, you know, structure. And when it comes to work, I have, you know, great teams at, at, at all my businesses. I have great leaders, great staff. So 90% of, of the BS, I don't have to deal with. So, you know, once I finish what I have to do, Physically, I thank God that I have a team that, you know, uh, handles all my, my other entities that I don't have to be so hands on with. So I'm yeah, a, I'm, I my, my, my life is home. Too. I think that's part of my problem. I got a, a great, great team that runs a bunch of my business, but I still like to be hands on when it comes to a lot of my stuff. And, you know, when you when you have businesses, you can't predict like it's always something that could happen that is unexpected. And so it does require sometimes having to be like, man, I didn't think this was going to happen. Like if somebody breaks in or, you know, there's some type of emergency. I know a turnover rate with a lot of businesses have been really tough right now. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of unexpected things that happen, too. So and it's, it's kind of tough. And life is great. You know what I mean? Because like I said, my, my life, my, when I, when people say life, you got to really think about what what life means. Life for me is being a father and husband. So those hours I'm not at work, I'm home. I don't, I don't have no extracurricular activities. <laughs> like, yeah, I, both, I like being home. That's what I enjoy be, doing. Yeah. I mean, like you said, life is, is is my family. And it was nothing better than taking my kids trick-or-treating last night. Boy, did I have a great time in them. Watching them have a good time. But let's go to the phone lines. Hello, who's this? This is Jay from Indy. Talk to us. Work-life balance. Yeah, I, I unintentionally ended my relationship with my girl being on the road, man. Oh, Damn. What do you do? Uh, I'm a truck driver. Oh, that's the tough. My only life. Yeah, yeah. And I, I was making so much money, but she kept telling me to come home. But I started getting greedy because the money was too good, man. And next thing you know, she was like, I can't take it no more. And she just, her mental being without me, and she just ended up saying, hey, I can't do it no more. I was gone for two or three weeks at a time, but the money was so good, I thought it was fine. Mm. She should have got her CDL, too, and came on the road with you. Y'all could have been partners. <laughs> Yeah, well, I told her, man, like, the money good, but hey, I guess all money ain't good money. So if you so, could have done things differently... I should have stayed. I should have stayed on because they had in town stuff too. But being on the road, I don't know if y'all know the money is way better. So yeah, I, know. I was just like, yo, I was being greedy. Unfortunately, it ended like that. So. And especially the last three years, four years, when everybody needs stuff shipped up and down the road and prices are higher, you guys are making the killing. I know that was way difficult. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I thought it was all good. Like, I'd give her a little bit of money, everything would be cool. But I guess everybody's it's not, all not about that. like that. Yeah. Nope. Most important thing is time, brother. Appreciate it. Bye, bro. 800-585-1051. We're talking work-life balance. We'll take some more calls when we come back. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. I know it, man. I like it. 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 I
Call me. Add your opinion to the Breakfast Club top. Come on. 800-585-1051. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlamagne Tha God. We are The Breakfast Club. Now, if you're just joining us, we're talking work-life balance. Now, this uh, conversation comes from Tom Brady, right, Yee? Yeah, he's unfortunately going through a divorce, and part of the issue was he's playing football, and he's, you know, got to focus on two things, but sometimes, you know, it just doesn't work that way. And I know there's a lot of people out there that have to make that money to support themselves, support their families. And sometimes that work-life balance isn't easy. All right. Well, let's go to the phone lines. Let's discuss. Hello. Who's this? What's going on? It's Frank. Hey, what's up, bro? Talk to us. Work-life balance. Hey, listen. Let me tell you this. Normally, I rock with Charlemagne. Normally, everything Charlemagne say, I'm 100% with. But this time, Envy, I'm with you, man. What's that? but, But I will say this. What I do for a living, there is no balance. What Tom Brady does for a living, there is no balance. He's been dreaming to be a football player since he was four years old. Right. Only person who can tell him when that expiration date is is God, man. Nobody knows what his goal is. Now that 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 ain't true. Now you say the only person can tell him. You say the only person can tell him his expiration date is God. Michael Parsons give him that right sack and break something. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) That doctor will tell his ass that it's time to hang it up too. (laughs) <laughs> nah, nah, it is. it's true, true, but that's also true, God. You know what I'm saying? In a way, my point, my point though is honestly, I don't feel like there is a balance. I feel like if you if you put 100 percent into work, you will not have 100 percent at home. That's just me personally. Oh, that's why it's called work life balance. Ain't nobody. It's impossible to have 100 percent of 100 yeah. percent. Like you, you got to be 60, 40, 50, 50. Nah, it's- there is no balance, man. There is no balance. I, 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 I don't believe I don't, Well, that's I, a I decision, that. though. You know, you make a decision to sacrifice one part of your life for another, and sometimes people regret that decision. Right, but don't give me an ultimatum to say either retire from football Oh, I'm leaving. Don't give me that ultimatum. We, but we, we don't know if that's the case, and we can't use Tom Brady's situation because his is very yeah, yeah, unique, yeah, right, bro. Right. We're talking about you. Right. Hey, hey Charlamagne, <laughs> I just want to say I love you, brother, man. Keep doing what you're doing. I love you too, black man. We love you too, man. We love you too. Thank you. Congratulations on your new show. But Thank you. Thank you, my guy, man. I love you to death, my brother. I appreciate that, King. I, I really appreciate that more than you know. Thank you, black man. <laughs> Hello, who's this? <laughs> Felicia. Hey, Alyssa, we're talking work-life balance. No, it's Felicia. Like, bye, Felicia. Oh, bye, Felicia. Bye, Felicia. Hey, Felicia, Felicia. how are you? Hey, I just want to say first and foremost, I love y'all. I listen to you all the time. We love you back. But let me tell you, this has been a stressful night. (laughs) With a lot of trick-or-treating? Well, no, something a little bit more unusual. What happened? What happened? About 210 miles a night on a paper route, and then I work eight hours a day at a hardware store. Woo. Well, you, sound like you don't have no work life balance, yeah, you have man. No work life balance. I'm down here in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Hey, eight four three, what's happening, Myrtle Beach? Hey, holla! <laughs> I'm riding my route, and I run up on a man with nothing but boxers on. Okay, laying in the middle of the street. I call nine one one. Finally, get rescue there. They show up, then the police show up, and they act like I hit the man. I, f- I feel like there's holes. I feel like there's holes in this story, ma'am. Why are you a suspect? <laughs> Why That's would you? I'm like he's in boxers. He ain't even got shoes on. Obviously, there's something wrong here. <laughs> well, I don't know what that I got to do with work life balance, on. but thank you for calling but the police for it. She's trying to clear like her name. Her. Okay, all right. <laughs> thank you. I don't know what's going on out there in South Carolina. <laughs> Hello, who's this? Hi, this is Asia calling from Dallas. Um, well, actually Virginia, but I always work in Dallas. 757, what's up? Let's talk about it. Work-life balance. Work-life balance is really important. I actually just got out of the service. I was in the Navy for 10 years, and I had to learn that once I get off of work, off the ship, or out of the building, it's a, I got to go home. I got to take care of my baby. I got to take care of my family. Like, don't call, don't text, don't do nothing. Okay. All right. I'm with you. Like that's what I'm saying. Like you know, when when that, when people see that life part, it's just like, what does life mean to you? If you're looking at life and you're saying, well, how do I have a social life and how do I do this and how do I do that? For me, my life is my family. You know, my life is my exactly. wife and my kids. So I mean, I'm good. Exactly. But like the military try to teach you, like this is it. This is you know, if them kids or that family didn't come in your seat bag, then they don't matter. But to me. My family is everything. This uh, military career is just not 
the on on the totem pole, the military is below my way below my family. Word up. I'm with you. That's how it should be. Thank you, mama. Hello, who's this? Hi, this is Jonathan from Miami. Hey, Jonathan, talk to us. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. I want to say three quick things. Thank you for having me on. And uh, Tom Brady's a father, a father of three, right? He's one quick kid away from not, you know, his kids not not having him, right? I'm a professor of entrepreneurship at Miami Dade College. I specifically chose this job so then I could be with my kids, you know, and my wife. And, and, and Charlemagne the God, you know, I, I get it, you know. People love what they do, but the work-life balance is so important because it can affect your mental health. That's right. But, yeah, but right? also it can affect your mental health if, if you have a dream or you want to do something you want to accomplish and you can't finish it. That could affect your mental health as well. You're correct. We, there could be two rights, right? And uh, Angela Yee, you're, you're an entrepreneur, right? You you do so many different things. Mm -hmm. I love to interview all of you for, for a book and a, and a class I'm doing. But it's important to... Because what's his name? He, he can't, the kids can't replace their father. Right, mm -hmm. the job in the NFL can replace the quarterback, and so I, my previous job, I had shingles, you know, and it was the worst thing in my life, wow. you know, and no more. I want to see my kids graduate. I want to pick them up from school. There's nothing like that. So, yes, I have a yeah. passion for education, but I have a passion for my children and my family first. And you know, also too, we got to make sure we're not staying busy just as a response to trauma. Because, you know, uh, uh, oftentimes staying busy, working a lot is really just a response to trauma because you feel like if you slow down, you got to actually deal with, you know, whatever is going on internally. Because when you look at somebody like Tom Brady, and I'm not judging him, I'm just saying 45 years old, seven Super Bowls, been to 10 Super Bowls, greatest quarterback of all time. What else is there to do? And this year he's been getting his ass handed to him. He's always on the ground. Yeah, I mean that's I think that's also a conversation that he needs to have with himself. But that is very true. You know, it's, it's what else does he need? When does he want to finish? When does he want to end this career? You know what I mean? Or like you said, the career will end it for him. But you know, for a lot of people, it, it's it's trying to put their family in positions that you know they that they didn't have. You know, like for me, I always look at generational wealth, and I want my kids just to be happy, right? And when I mean happy, it doesn't mean financially or money. It just means happy in life. And sometimes that comes from not being able to do things, not having to work, not having to make money. Um, and that's what I want for my kids. I want to set up businesses like a lot of these other people have for their kids. Um, and I'm not finished. I'm not done yet. So when I'm done, then... And we know it's a tough time relaxed. for people out there, too. You know, financially, people are playing catch up. Um, you know, since the pandemic, the price of a lot of things have gone up. So sometimes it's not even really just a choice. Sometimes you're working because you got to keep food on the table and you got to get the rent paid. No doubt. But ain't nobody working 168 hours a week. And that's all we have is 168 hours in a week. So it's just like, you know, with the rest of that time, just make sure you're spending it with the people that you love. If you, if you got a family. I'm just saying, if you got a family, that's where your extra time should be with them. All right. Well, is it moral to the story? Or well, that was the moral? The moral of the story is find some proper work-life balance. That's it. If you don't have any, find some. And life can also be your own self-care, too. You know, sometimes you're given to everybody and everything, but you got to take care of yourself as well. All right. Well, we got rumors on the way? Yes. And let's talk about Cheryl Lee Ralph. She was calling out Delta Airlines because they wouldn't check in her luggage. She was four minutes late. So there's a debate on who was right and who was wrong. All right. We'll get into that next. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. Justin. All the guys. Gossip. The Rumor Report. Gossip. With Angela. Angela Yee. It's the Rumor Report. The Breakfast Club. All right, well, Shara Lee Ralph is upset with Delta Airlines because they would not check in her luggage. She was four minutes late. And here's what she said on social media. This just happened. I went to the airline, you know, the one that I'm a three million miler on, to check my bags, and I was four minutes late. Because they need 45 minutes for you to check in. And the woman said, oh, there is absolutely nothing we can do for you. I was like, um, it's only four minutes. I've, I've checked in on flights later than this with more. Oh, absolutely not. And I was just saying, you know what? In these days and times, just be kinder, just be nicer. Cause you just never, ever know. Anyway, I just bought my, my ticket on American Airlines and we'll be flying now. Thank you. God bless you and be well. Three million miles—a lot of miles. She that flew a lot, lot of Delta. Miles. 
Mm-hmm. I'm a million miles finally, but three million miles? Yeeks. And I agree with her, but what if there's nothing the airline could have done but in there's that rules moment? and regulations. Yeah, I mean, what if they really had finished, you know... I mean, that's happened to me before, you know? Mm-hmm. That's happened to all of us, I'm yeah. sure. You get there mm-hmm. and you can't check your bag because it's too late. But sometimes they'll accommodate you in other ways. They'll be they'll let you take your bag straight to the um to gate, the gate to check and it, then yeah. check it at Depending the gate. How big it like is. there's always things that can Depending happen. Depending how big it is. Depending Paul. how it big just, it is, Paul. Yes. Yeah, because it might not be able to fit through the uh, security. That's right. But I, I, you know, I got into an incident over the weekend with with, with a Delta Uh-oh. person. But now I, I, what I'm realizing is uh, because I guess the staff is being overworked, they are. I don't want to say not as nice as they usually are, but like staff members, I'm noticing, like even when they say put your seat up, it's not as nice as it should be. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. I got into an altercation of a day. No, you're right. And she said she was going to write me up. No, you're but right. That's why She's going to write you up? I didn't know they do that. Yeah, no, they write you up, put no, on your profile. No, one of the best things that you can experience on a plane is just people treating you like you're a human and not a like just a Correct. product. Like they treat us like we're almost like cattle. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, get on, sit down. Sit down. I always try to figure out a solution, though, when I'm at the airline. I've actually had some great experiences with with people being really helpful to me. And I know a lot of times it can be your approach, too. But she said they needed 45 minutes for you to check in, right? Usually they tell you an hour. So 45 minutes is probably like the dead... You know, and I ain't go front. It's, minimum. It's, it's usually it's usually the people that look like me are the nicest and coolest and they chillest. And they the ones. Hey, can you put your seat up, please, sir? Are the Dominicans? Or it, no, black people ask. Because I'm gonna tell you something that just <laughs> they, just happened nicest, to me. But people that are not, they're usually the a holes. When they're I was in those, DC the, the and I and I was coming back, um, because I wanted to make it to Powerhouse in time, so I had to change my flight to leave a little earlier. When I called, they told me it was gonna be four hundred something dollars to change the flight to get back an hour earlier. But when I got to the airport, they did it for me and they only charged me thirty four dollars and so sometimes that's always the case though if you're a diamond member they usually don't charge at all easy well was it i was going from instead of to um jfk i was flying into laguardia because yeah, it was a different airport so because let you do it because though. it wasn't the same airport it's not a same day change it's a whole different flight yes yeah sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll let you do that but but what she did was they put me on standby on another flight and, they put you on and the then flight, they, so it was free yeah mm-hmm. everybody, everybody just doing er, to this lady too yeah everybody's just doing the best they can man i hope i would hope I got to put a complaint into that lady because she put a complaint in for me for hopefully they X each other out. Oh, my goodness. Stop it. All right. Now, Oprah is complaining about how her name is being falsely used to sell diet pills and gummies. And the fact that she even had to address this shows you how many people have been approaching her. It happened to me again today. A woman came up to me and said, can you help me get your weight loss gummies? And I said, (laughs) ma'am, I don't have anything to do with weight loss gummies. And let me just tell you, you're the fifth person this week to mention it. So I'm going to address it. So this is my attempt to address it. It's come to my attention many times over. Somebody's out there misusing my name, even sending emails to people advertising weight loss gummies. I have nothing (laughs) to do with weight loss gummies or diet pills. And I don't want you all taken advantage of by people misusing my name. Dropping the, a, drop a clues bombs for Oprah, man. She got the juice about it. Because nobody's really going to see that. And, they, and what happens is they, they send these emails, these texts, somebody doesn't hear that, and they continue to buy it. She got the juice. She got to pull a 50 cent. Or she might have to be like, because she does have a, a stake in Weight Watchers. Might be time to come out with some Weight Watchers, weight loss gummies. There you o- go. O- Oprah really wanted to say, <laughs> my net worth is $2.5 billion. I don't have to sell no damn gummy bears. If I look like ho. Uh, you know who I am? <laughs> I'll buy all those gummies and flat tummy teas and flush them down the toilet. Don't play with me. Big old nigga. All right. Now, Taylor Swift is breaking records with her latest album. (laughs) She has 10 out of the 10 of the Hot 100 songs. Who's that? Who that is? Taylor Swift. So she said 10 out of 10. And on my 10th album, I'm in shambles. So the top 10 songs are all Taylor Swift songs from her Midnight's album. Have you heard any of of her music? Antihero. That's the number one. And I actually saw the video as well. And so, yeah, and she has the woulda, coulda, shoulda song that's what, about her breakup. What's the big Taylor Swift song? Party in the USA? Party in the USA? What, what's the big I one? I don't remember. I just know Taylor Swift is big. I remember back in the day, uh, you know, like when we first, first started at MTV and uh, me and Duval never, ever, was ever, up there doing ever, something back together. and all the kids ever. was going crazy and he was like, who is that? And they was like, oh, that's Taylor Swift. Like, they was, they was like, y'all don't know Taylor Swift? I said, no. And then we was like, Gucci, me and Duval was like, I bet y'all don't know Gucci, man. And they was like, no. And I was like, all right, we even. <laughs> <laughs> But, but what, yeah, that's I mean, the biggest song. The never, ever, ever. I don't know if that's her biggest song, but I like that song. I mean, look, like, every now oh, and then. Oh, she didn't then, do Party in the USA. That was Miley Cyrus, right? 
Oh, okay. <laughs> Every now and then I do like Attilis, but Antihero is the one that, remember there was all the controversy over the video with the word fat on the scale, and then she took it out of the video? That's you know, right. Taylor, she was Taylor the one selling them um, gummies, <laughs> them gummies and blaming it on Oprah. Taylor, but Oprah. she's also a great songwriter for other people, too. Who did Since You've Been Gone? Since You've Been Gone. Kelly Clarkson. Okay, Envy. I don't I think, know. Ain't you a DJ? I think it's Kelly Some Clarkson of those parties Kelly... you at, you might want to play a couple of these songs. Was that Kelly Clarkson or Kelly Ripper? Shut Kelly up. Ripper. <laughs> you and sure? That is Kelly your Bundy? Rumor reports. Kelly Ripper. Kelly Ripper. Since you've been gone. Kelly Ripper. Kelly Ripper. Since, Ripper. since you've been gone. Yeah, because Kelly Ripper won American Idol and Kelly Clarkson be on um be on that show sure. with uh Ryan Seacrest. Yes, you're right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Well, I'm glad we bomb for Oprah again though. <laughs> How you go from Kelly to Kelly Clarkson and then drop a bomb from Oprah? Cause man, Oprah's a check my resume. I'm a billionaire in real life, not just evaluations, cash, assets. Play with me. Don't ever think I'm down bad and got to sell gummy bears, Gail. Ain't nothing worse. Gail, so, Gail some... Stedman, they got your girl left up. <laughs> Pass that to Kelly. They making me drink this early. I gotta address this BS. Oh my goodness. I don't think Oprah drinks to kill. I think she yes, she does. More, more of a wine. Yeah, Oprah drinks to kill. A Catherine Dragon is boy. Think so? Well, t- I, I know so. Drop a clues bomb for the big O. He's talking more like about a wine drinker. All right. No. That's what you're going to tequila. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm going to send us some brands in it. Uh, I Don't said some tequila and you talk about cognac. Oh, I'm going to try. You might as well send us some of that too. Mm-hmm. What are you giving that donkey to, man? Clarence Thomas he needs to come to the front of the congregation. We'd like to have a word with him. All right. We'll yes. get to that next. It's the Breakfast Club. Good morning. The Breakfast Club. Your mornings will never be the same. Any first responder will tell you. Never try to beat a train. After braking, it can take a mile for a train to completely stop. So when you come to a rail crossing, stop. Because trains can't. Paid for by NHTSA. It's time for Donkey of the Day. Mm-hmm. I'm a big boy. I can take it. If he feel I deserve it, ain't no big deal. I know Charlamagne guy gonna have some funny sweet <laughs> say out his mouth. Just gotta say something you may not agree with doesn't mean I'm mean. Who's getting that donkey? That donkey. That don't, 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 don't. Donkey of the Day right there. <laughs> The, the Breakfast Club, bitches. You can call me the donkey of the day, but like, I mean no harm. Donkey of the day for Tuesday, November 1st goes to Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. Now, if you haven't heard, the Supreme Court's conservative majority appears likely to abolish race-conscious university admissions. What does that mean? Well, nearly 20 years ago, the U.S. Supreme Court determined that universities may consider race in their admissions process in an effort to achieve a more diverse campus. But on yesterday, Halloween, that spooky-ass Supreme Court uh, was confronting the role of race in college admissions. In fact, the conservative justices repeatedly doubted whether universities would reach an endpoint in race conscious admissions. They want to end affirmative action in college admissions. Let's go to KTLA 5 for the report, please. Big changes could be coming to college campuses across the country. My identity can never be limited to my academic standing. As student protesters gathered in the rain outside the U.S. Supreme Court today, the justices considered eliminating affirmative action for college applications. I've heard the word uh, diversity quite a few times, and I don't have a clue what it means. Uh, It seems to mean everything for everyone. No vote today, but the conservative members of the court appear ready to end race consideration for college admissions. Chief Justice John Roberts insisted there's no clarity on when affirmative action would end. Your position is that race matters because it's necessary for diversity, which is necessary for the sort of education you want. It's not going to stop mattering at some particular point. You're always going to have to look at race because you say race matters to give us the necessary diversity. Justice Katanji Brown Jackson and other liberals argue ending affirmative action would deny students their rights to equal protection, and many students agree. That damn Clarence. His real name's Clarence, and Clarence lives at home thinking he's a racist white parent. Now, I don't have to tell y'all how this decision would dramatically reduce enrollment rates among students of color, do I? I also don't have to tell you why this is yet another reason why they should expand the Supreme Court. I've been telling y'all four things that need to be done to protect democracy. Eliminate the filibuster so you can properly legislate. Protect voting rights. Prosecute everybody involved in the attempted coup of this country on January 6th. And expand the Supreme Court. All right, not doing that has led to women's reproductive rights being taken away. And no telling what other rights will be taken away. And this seems to be one of the next ones on the chopping block. I could give them donkey today for just considering this. But what I'm giving Clarence donkey of the day for is being a black man who constantly not only votes against his own interests and the interests of people who look like him. 
Okay, notice I didn't say his own people because he doesn't identify as one of us, but he's always voting against the interests of his own people. Okay, whether he knows he's one of us or not. All right, but not only voting against us, he doesn't even understand the basics of what it is to be one of us. All right, look, we know that a lot of us are diversity hires. All right, <laughs> especially in government. Clarence Thomas was a diversity hire, at least on the surface. All right, we, we have all these conversations about diversity and inclusion and equity, but Clarence Thomas doesn't even know what that is. Seriously, he said he doesn't know what diversity is. Play that again for me, Ray. Uh, Mr. Park, um, I've heard the word uh, diversity quite a few times, and I don't have a clue what it means. Uh, it seems to mean everything for everyone. I don't think diversity means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Let me hear it one more time. Uh, Mr. Park, um, I've heard the word uh, diversity quite a few times, and I don't have a clue what it means. Uh, it seems to mean everything for everyone. That explains a lot. Right? We, we know what diversity is. What's the textbook definition of diversity? It's the practice or quality of including or involving people from a range of different social and ethnic backgrounds and of different genders, sexual orientations, race. Example, equality and diversity should be supported for their own sake. Right? Which is why I don't understand how a black man doesn't support diversity for his own sake. And not just support, even know what it is. Is Clarence Thomas that delusional about who he is? Clarence Thomas, you are supposed to be diversity. The problem is you clearly don't know you're black, right? So I truly agree that you probably don't know what diversity is or what it represents because you don't represent it. So this doesn't surprise me, all right? Clarence Thomas doesn't know what diversity is. He don't know what inclusion is. He probably don't know what black is. Look, man, all skin folk ain't kin folk. And this is why representation only matters if the person representing knows they represent. Please let Remy Ma give Clarence Thomas the biggest hee-haw. Hee-haw, hee-haw, you stupid mother are you dumb? And I, I'll rephrase, uh, you know, this is why representation only matters if the person representing us knows they representing us. Okay? All right. Okay. All right, well, thank you for that donkey today. Now, uh, yesterday, you guys got a chance to interview uh, the co-founder of the Civil Rights Corporation and... Right. Of corpse and an, uh, an attorney for Legal Aid Society. I really enjoyed this conversation. Mm -hmm. Tell me about it because I wasn't here. Well, I got to tell you about it when they about to come in next and they can tell you well, all about themselves. What's the name? Who, who are they? I, I wasn't here yesterday. I can't pronounce. I, I know Alec and I cannot pronounce that sister's name. I call. Al I, I was calling her Ole. <laughs> what? Alec Carrick Katsanis. <laughs> I was. And Olayemi Oloren. Olayemi. 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 Salute to Olayemi. Okay, well, mm -hmm. we're going to speak with them next. At I still don't feel like I'm pronouncing it right, but I'm going to tell you something. Yeah, she said it's Olayemi. Oh, that sister is brilliant, mm -hmm. and I cannot wait. Uh, for y'all to hear the work that they're doing. Coming okay. up next. All right, we'll get to that next. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. The Breakfast Club. Power 105.1. The Breakfast Club. Your mornings will never be the same. Yep, it's the world's most dangerous morning show, The Breakfast Club. Charlemagne the God, Angela Yee. We have uh, some special guests. Who we got, Yee? <laughs> Alec, I don't want to say your name, Lauren Kara, because I've seen it so many times, and I saw you on Trevor Noah, and I still can't do it. Hold on. That's why I passed Kara it to you. Kara Katsanis. <laughs> that's perfect. Kara Katsanis. Yeah, that's great. Is that really right, though? Yeah, that's great. Okay. <laughs> the second the second name ain't no easier. Yeah. Ola Yemi Oloren. Ola Yemi Oloren. But say Ole. Ole. Yes. Ole. Yes. I know you heard that forever Listen, growing up. Listen, all the things. <laughs> <laughs> like Yemi? Oh, yes. Like Yemi is what everybody in the Bahamas and my family says, but I don't identify as Yemi. <laughs> but okay. you could say it. I'll let you, I'll let you get it off. <laughs> now, Alec is the co-founder of the Civil Rights Corps. Uh, Alemi, oh, Ola Yemi is Ola a lawyer Yemi. for yes. the Legal Aid Society. Good morning. How are y'all? Good. Great. Thanks for having us. Now, Alec, I did. I told you I did see you on Trevor Noah. And so I'm aware of the work that you're doing. But I want to talk about that. And I know today we're talking about copaganda. So can you tell us what that is? Yeah, copaganda is the way that the police and a lot of the companies that profit off of the criminal punishment system in this country convince us to support policies that make us less safe. Mm. They make us scared. They make us afraid. And they use that to boost their own budgets and their own profits. And so propaganda is how the media is constantly getting us to focus on low level things that poor people do mm -hmm. and have us ignore a lot of the things that are really dangerous that people in power and wealthy people do. 
Things like wage theft that costs $50 billion a year. It's five times all property crime combined. Now, what is wage theft for people who are listening and like, I don't know what that is. Wage theft is when your boss, your company, um, doesn't pay you what they're supposed to pay you. They're supposed to pay you a certain rate and they dock some of your hours. They don't let you take the right required breaks. They don't pay you for, for getting ready for work. They give you a paycheck that doesn't have all your hours on it. And that costs poor people in this country about $50 billion a year. That's what's that? What do you call that? A white collar crime, right? That's what we call white collar crime, and and you don't see that on the nightly news every night. You don't mm-hmm. see all the illegal evictions, and you don't see the building code violations and the safety code violations, the workplace safety violations. You don't see the water mm-hmm. violations. People are tracking lead poisoning that that kills children all over the country. There, there's there's government agencies that track that, but not like the police. They don't issue public press releases. They don't have news conferences where they tell you which companies are poisoning your kids' water. And so as a result, a lot of people treat shoplifting from Walgreens more seriously than more urgently than they treat the things that are killing us. Like air pollution kills 100,000 people a year in this country, five times more than all homicide combined. Do you think it's because those things you can't really see? You feel them and you know the impact, but a murder, a robbery, a... Rape, a child abduction, like you can see those things. No, it's just the deliberate way in which we sensationalize crime, right? Because 80% of everything in our criminal system, all of our criminal cases are misdemeanors, traffic offenses, are nonviolent crime. But you would have no idea if you look at what the media plays up as crime, you would see, oh, robberies, murder, homicide. In actuality, if you're a public defender like me, I've represented over a thousand people in New York City. You're not getting those cases. Mm-hmm. They're not a bunch of ro- uh, robbers and murderers and spicy cases, just just crimes of poverty. And that's the vast majority of who's in our criminal system but if you watch tv if you watch all these shows these sensationalize it you see a system that looks like it's everybody there you watch the shows you watch the flash they in jail they got a bunch of white people in jail you see uh they have all these different kinds of crimes and you think oh i have a system that reflects that then you get in any criminal courtroom and it's just me and you just all over the court and then the only people that look like the white people they show you in law and order and all these other different kinds of people that are prosecuting are there just as the police as the judges as the lawyers so i love the term you use you said uh crimes of poverty because i feel like most criminal things you see in the hood are crimes of poverty exactly. everything from drug dealing to robbery everything is a crime of poverty exactly like that's the thing all my clients have in common is that they're all poor mm-hmm. and i think something people need to recognize they know a public defender is for poor people but they don't realize how poor and the fact that that's everybody there like to qualify for my services you have to have little to no income at all wow. over 60 percent of people that are incarcerated now in this country made prior to arrest made annually less than twelve thousand dollars so that's the kind of poverty we're dealing with like i up until recently identified myself as the broke and I would not have qualified for my <laughs> services. They would tell me I need to hire an attorney and I wouldn't be able to afford one. So you have to recognize that you live in a system. If we're in New York City, you take, for example, there are almost 10 million people in the city. We have Rikers. Rikers is built to hold 3,000 people, but 5,000 people here. And they're all represented by public defenders, right? Mm-hmm. So underneath the poverty line, why in a city where 42% of the people are fully white, over 90% of the people at Rikers are black or brown and poor? Wow. Now, I want to talk about bail reform, right, because that's a hot issue with elections coming up. And I feel like we're getting a lot of misinformation. We talk about the TV and what the media sensationalizes. And so you've been, Alec, instrumental in making sure that bail reform uh, is not monetary. Right. When, When you talk about people getting out on bail, like we've just been talking about people who don't have the money to be able to afford that. You could be sitting in jail because you got a ticket that you didn't pay. Yeah. And now I'm in jail because I don't have enough money. Um, to bond out. So can you talk about that? Because I see so many people saying this person got out on bail and then they went and committed this crime and that's why bail reform is bad. You're letting these criminals get right back out to do the same crimes over and over again. The first thing you have to understand is all of those attacks are basically paid for by Republicans. They are racist. They're unscientific. Let's start from what we know. Why did we do bail reform? We did bail reform. You know, when I started working on this issue after Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, when I got to Ferguson, Ferguson had 3.6 arrest warrants per household, almost all of them for unpaid debt, almost all of them for a black family, right? And when people were jailed, they were jailed because they couldn't pay cash bail of $100, $200, $300. When I started working on these cases in Ferguson and Louisiana and Mississippi, Alabama and California and Chicago, um, there were 500,000 human beings in a jail cell in this country every single night just because they couldn't pay. Not because they were found to be dangerous or a threat to anyone, but because their families were poor. And what we know from the scientific evidence is that jails cause more crime. Because jails take people away from their homes, their schools, their churches, their jobs. And 
They take people away from their mental health treatment they're getting, their medical care that they're getting. And what happens when you destabilize someone's life like that, even two, three, four days in jail after their arrest, you actually scientifically, you make them more likely to commit crime in the future. So when we started doing bail reform these last six or seven years, we've gotten a lot of people out of jail. We saved a lot of people from convictions. We put a lot of families back together, children with their parents. And, and when we studied this, like professors across the country have been studying this. And what they found is that it actually reduces crime. Mm -hmm. So all these talking points you're getting, fear mongering, it's, it's kind of like Willie Horton style. Like they're, they're picking one case here, one case there. But when you actually look at all the evidence, it's actually like climate science denial to say that bail reform is causing more crime. Why do you think that uh, they don't make prisons actual correctional facilities? Because I, I can never say that. I know abolitionists don't necessarily believe in, in, mm -hmm. in prisons. I can never say we shouldn't have prisons, but why don't they make them actual correctional facilities? Like when they go there, they can get uh, learn some type of trade. They can get proper mental health services. You know, they can get because actual it's tools. System. Because it's a profit system. Mm -hmm. That's 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 the reality, right? Like when when you say mass incarceration is slavery, people think that you're just trying to make a moral appeal or you're trying to condemn something. But no, in actuality, if slavery is a system by which we deprive people of their freedom and their personal liberty and we force them to work for another's gain, right? We have over two million people that are incarcerated in America. Four hundred thousand of those people are being held pretrial. Those people in private and public prisons produce over eleven point six billion dollars in goods for the country. Their families and fines and fees associated with the convictions and costs are in over over $27 billion of debt. That's mm. why, because they're there, they're there to, to provide a service. They're not there. If we're funneling, when you think about it, right, we're funneling the exact same under-resourced communities through mm -hmm. the prison system. This whole idea that uh, the police are there to protect and serve or that mass incarceration is there for our benefit. We spend over $277 billion on prisons and policing every year and another $80, $80 billion just on prison and yet we say wow. every year this is not any safer we're not safer the place is more dangerous but it's the same it's the same communities how come the most safe communities are not the most uh police communities why are they the most under-resourced communities repeatedly and it's for what alec was talking about if you it's not just the fact that prison takes you away and it destabilizes you but it also warehouses you amongst the worst social ills we all know suicide is the most is the the leading cause of death in prisons Thousands of people commit suicide and it's over 76 percent of the people that commit suicide in prisons and local jails. They are held for less than a week. So this is this mm -hmm. like heinous, heinous, obvious, um, terrible system. And we know this and we recognize it. But yet we continue to put all the money there and not into people because it's not there about rehabilitating them. We know that because if you you warehouse them, this, they go back into their communities with all of the same terrible things that they've learned, all the violence, all of the things you claim to be condemning. All it does is guarantee if I have fines, fees and everything associated, I'm already the most impoverished community. And now I'm in further debt. What happens? What happens? That's right. So that's why. All right, we got more with Alec and Olayemi. When we come back, it's the Breakfast Club. Good morning. Oops. And Olayemi from the Legal Aid Society. Charlamagne? What about uh, President Biden's Safe for America plan? What do y'all think of that? The plan is a disaster. I agree. Yeah. The plan is a disaster. It's not a serious plan. I mean, um, it's attempting to add 100,000 new cops. Look, as I said earlier, this country spends more money on cops, prosecutors, and prisons than any society in the recorded history of the modern world. Did you know that the U.S. has five times the prison population that we our, our, our own society had 50 years ago? Mm -hmm. We now cage black people at six times the rate of South Africa at the height of apartheid. Yes. The solution is not 100,000 more cops. Wow. And Biden knows this. Biden knows what the scientific evidence shows. He knows the early childhood education and health care, right? And giving people resources in their community, he's not, he's not like, He's made this mistake before. And they know that. And they, and they, and yeah. you know what? They know it. Because when it comes, at the end of the day, there's so much gaslighting and pandering and wasting our breath they make us do. Because at the end of the day, when it's their children, when it's their family members, whenever you see it's a scandal involving somebody, their mm -hmm. husband, their kid, I'm not, they don't want cr crime. That's not even on the table. Right. They are not interested. You don't hear nobody jumping up talking about, I really think prison would help. That really help Hunter. That do Hunter That's good. Right. You That's know right. what I mean? They're That's not right. saying that. They know that. They're There's aware. so much empathy for his own son and exactly. his son fought his addiction. Exactly. You know, like. Exactly. Now, with, with elections coming up, like we've been discussing, right, if Republicans, Republicans get control of Congress, how do you think that's going to affect everything? 
We're at a very dangerous <laughs> moment with the Republican Party. It's That's incredibly, incredibly. Well, incredibly. We've been saying this for years. Yes. Fasci- I, I, remember, I remember when I used to use the word fascist, you're like, oh, you're overreacting. Yes. Like, you're fascist. Yes. And like, we're not get- going there in America. Yes. I've had people come on this show and tell me that when I would yes. say we're fast approaching fascism. Yes, people would. People to this day, people get mad when I say no. It is let's stop engaging in and legitimizing and pretending they are white supremacists. They're galvanized around that. It's so interesting. The problem with living in a country that treats everything else as other and white is the default is. All the rest of us, when we're actually rallying around our interests or what we actually need to do to survive, then it's identity politics. But it's conveniently ignored that we have an entire party that is galvanized around nothing but whiteness and white supremacy loud in our face. We know it. It is the most clear, transparent. It has gone from from rhetoric you had to parse out or statistics you had to go get a magnifying glass to to insurrections and all mm-hmm. kind of foolishness. We know it as clear as day. So dangerous is an understatement they are quite literally right now there are two there are two cases today in front of in front of the supreme court um challenging affirmative action and we all already know mm-hmm. with this mickey mouse court we yeah. have we saw we already know how it's gonna go we already know it's gonna go and the only, the, the only benefit i could see is it's important for people to start seeing that people are the champion of their own civil liberties and not the government and not the court because the court in these kinds of places have been very instrumental throughout all of America's history in legitimizing all kind of discri- uh, discrimination and predi- just prejudice. Is there, is you see there, it now. Is there anything we can do? Because, you know, you mentioned the courts. It's like the courts are already stacked. It's we, like from the Supreme Court to the federal court. Like, what do you do? Well, the federal courts are really stacked. And, and of course, we, that's a, a long, multi-year strategy that a lot of us are working on. But the Republicans the state worked courts, on it. They, they, they did. That's Why right. Not? And a lot of people didn't see this, but the, the, the architect, when the main architect of that, the Federalist Society, they just got a $1.6 billion donation. Yeah. A lot of people aren't talking about this. That's more money than basically the entire criminal justice reform field has spent in the last decade. Yeah. And one donation from one person to the Federal Society. Imagine what they did without that $1.6 billion. So I think what we need to do is understand that it's not just federal courts. There are the court systems across the country are full of elected and appointed judges. All over the country, in every city, there's thousands and thousands of judges. There's thousands and thousands of of opportunities to get involved in your own community. Court watching, bail funds, mutual aid. There are ways to get involved in your own community right where you are and watch what judges are doing. You can work on on um, efforts to change how your local legal system is operating. It's, it's actually kind of an exciting time in some respects because across the country, people are coming together and realizing that something has to be done. Mm-hmm. How can they find more information on what y'all to do? I would say um, justicenotfair.org is an incredible website and resource that's been following and actually debunking and giving you the actual facts, statistics and everything coming out um, for bail reform in New York City, bail reform in Cook County, bail reform in all these different places. So justicenotfair.org is an incredible resource. And for you guys, your organization. Civil. My organization is called Civil Rights Corps. You can find us on social media at Civil Rights Corps. I write a newsletter about copaganda and all this stuff in the media we were talking about called Alex Copaganda Newsletter. You can find me at Equality Alec on Twitter. And, you know, we, we both of us, we work on, on these issues because they're incredibly important and we're at an incredibly important time. And so it's not just enough to read about them and to look at social media. Find out who in your community is organizing against expanding the jails. And who in your community is building mutual aid and who is watching court and who is running a local bail fund and get involved in your own community. It, it, there's so many amazing organizers across the country, who, every city. I mean, and, and reach out to us if you can't find them in your neighborhood. Reach out to me on Twitter, DM me, and I'll connect you with someone in your local community. Yes. Oh, yeah. My sub stack is Olurinati. It's my baby. I release an essay every month and the Bahamas would literally disown me if I didn't mention that I was from the Bahamas <laughs> while I'm on here. So I was shout listening. out to my country. I, I hear the accent because you sound like you're from Charleston, but I'm like, that, I know that's the island. It's <laughs> yeah. an island somewhere. It's the Bahamas. Yes, and they would be upset. Okay. Salute to the Bahamas. The only person from that I hear shout out to the Bahamas uh, like that is Duval. Listen, <laughs> listen, he love he. You know what? I'm I'm not even going to say that. Lil Duval, love up, he love up the Bahamas. He be there. He's Bahamian. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, I know. Bahamas, we know. And Bahamas, let me know. Like, <laughs> We claim we've decided we claim Lil Duval. That's that's us. So <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. All right, and make sure you guys vote. And when before you vote, make sure you know who you're voting for. Because like you just said, it is very important that you hold people accountable in these local elections where you can actually make some changes. Yes. Now it is an exciting time, but we're nervous. <laughs> Thank y'all for joining us, man. Thank it's you. the Breakfast Club. Thank you. The Breakfast Club is the Rumor Report with Angela Yee. Rumor. Club. So listen up. Nah, 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 nah.
Well, we've been following this story all morning and hate to have to report this news about takeoff, but he has unfortunately passed away. He's been killed after an early morning shooting that happened in Houston. This went down shortly after 2.30 a.m., according to TMZ, and that's when cops got the call for a man who was shot at a bowling alley. That was 810 Billiards and Bowling, Houston. I was hoping it wasn't true when people were posting Mm -hmm. it early, but unfortunately, it has been confirmed. And according to reports, they were playing dice. Takeoff and Quavo were playing dice. That's when an altercation broke out. And unfortunately, Takeoff was shot and was pronounced dead on the scene. So sad, man. We do ask that people stop posting pictures and video of that. I mean, that's, you know, his family has to see that. His close friends have to see that. Um, and here is one of their most recent interviews. This is Take Off and Quavo on Drink Champs. It was always your time. It was your time to prove it. Is that something you had in your mind when you was going in recording? Oh, for sure. Okay. You know what I mean, uh, enough is enough. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm chill. You know, I'm trying to lay back, but mm-hmm. it's time to pop it. You know what I mean? I mean, it's time to give me my flowers. You know what I right. mean? I don't yes. want them later on when I ain't here. All right. So he was only 28 years old. Horrible, man. So sad, man. Terrible. Black man, 28 years old. Young man, you know? Don't just call him a rapper. That's somebody's son, nephew, mm. you know, family. It's horrible, man. And again, condolences to his family, his friends, and R.I.P. So sad, man. The brother was only 28 years old. And, uh, you know, it's just senseless, senseless gun violence. That's what I said. Stop, stop saying things like rappers are endangered species. Black men, period, are endangered species. You know? Like, that. I don't know. I don't like that rappers are like it's like no that's just that's another brother like we can pull up the newspaper go online and see so many uh, brothers getting shot every day killed every day for nothing i mean literally for nothing mm-hmm. every single time like there's never any real reason or motivation for behind any of this stuff all right now lamar odom has his own podcast now on the debut episode of on the low he talks about being flat broken in the darkest time of his life after he got divorced from chloe kardashian And he also discussed selling his championship rings from when he was the Lakers. He said that he actually had to pay off his medical bills after his near fatal drug overdose and pawn those rings in 2016. They were eventually sold at an auction in 2020. Here's what he said. But there was a time where I came up on when I came about the coma. You know, I checked my account. My was like at like double zero. I panicked. I'll go to a Laker game, and you know they hook me up with some some good tickets. And I get there, and I see um, this guy who used to sit right by us. Let's call him France for right now, my man France. So he says, "Yo, Lamar, bought, bought your rings." Now I pulled up on him, and he gave me my shit back for nothing. That's dope. That's amazing that a fan would do that. I wonder how much he paid for those rings, but the fact that he gave it back to him was was honorable. He didn't have to do that. Uh, he bought them for thirty six thousand six hundred dollars and seventy eight thousand dollars. Oh, so he spent over hundred grand. Mm hmm. And just was a fan and said, "Here, you can have them. You deserve to have them. You earned them." And he gave him back to Lamar Odom for free. That's dope. All right. Now, we told you before about Drake coming out during Little Wayne's Little Louisiana Fest in New Orleans over the weekend. Mm-hmm. But he did say that he was upset that Little Wayne did not bring him out when he performed Mrs. Officer. I guess earlier in Drake's career, that used to happen. And I want to say one more f-ing thing. You know, I was a little thrown off tonight because, you know, back in the day before I was Drake, I was Aubrey off the grassy, right? And I used to be standing side stage. And when Mrs. Officer came on, Lil Wayne used to call me on stage to sing Bobby Part, and he used to call me Jimmy Valentino. I feel like I should have sang Mrs. Officer tonight, I'm just saying. So I just wanted to say, when I get up all in y'all, we can hear the, we can see the sunshine before us. And when I'm in that thing, I, I make it say. All right. That's it's still a classic like song. New Orleans. Mm-hmm. I love you. All right. Well, that is your rumor report. You know what, man? I, I want to say RIP to take off again. Mm-hmm. And you know what bothers me the most about this situation? What? I don't have anything to say that doesn't sound like the same old script. That's like, that, same like That's what bothers me the most about this situation because it happens so much. Mm-hmm. It's like it's like talking about Nick Cannon expecting another baby. It's just uh, it's, it's just becoming another mm-hmm. headline. And it's just like, you know, the people will post their pictures with him and, you yeah. know, have these long captions and post Stories their old and all, yeah. clips and interviews and everything. And then next week, everybody will be moved on to something else until 
the next the next tragedy incident. we have in him. You right. know, another tragedy that did happen was Davido, his son actually passed away. And drowned. And drowned, yeah. He mm-hmm. was had just turned three, was in the swimming pool at his parents' house. Mm-hmm. And you know, they have not yet commented on, on their son's death, but the news of that tragic drowning has trended globally. I remember originally I saw the post about it. Then people were saying it wasn't true. But now a police spokesman did confirm to the BBC that mm. Mm. he mm. did drown on Monday. As, as a man, I wouldn't wish those two things on nobody. No. Like Those are the two things that you just absolutely him. positively dread. Yeah, You don't even want to think about it. You don't even want to talk mm. about it. You know what I mean? Your child dying or you getting killed by gun violence. Yeah, but our condolences again. That is absolutely tragic. Yeah, and I, and I always tell everybody that that has kids at the age of I think eight months or a year, you can take your kids to swimming lessons. And I always tell people to do that. I don't know what happened in that case or that incident, but I always just tell people when I hear any accident about in the pool, I just tell them to, to make sure that you take your kids early as possible. I know the YMCA a lot of times has free classes for for children and babies. But just take it early. I remember the, the reason I even learned how to swim, because I'm from Queens. We didn't have a, a swimming pool. But I went to a, a vacation in Florida, and the motel that we were staying at, one of the hotel holiday sixes, holiday inns, one of them hotels, uh, we couldn't swim in that pool that weekend because a kid had just drowned. And from there, my dad, when we got back home, he was like, I'm going to make sure you learn how to swim at an early age. And that always stuck with me for my kids as well. Well, they're reviewing the cameras to get additional information about the circumstances. But they did confirm eight members of the staff had been invited in for questioning. They're trying to figure out what actually did happen. Well, sending healing energy to DeVito's family, sending healing energy to the family to take off, man. All right. Well, it's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. Mix is up next. The Breakfast Club. Your mornings will never be the same. You might not have the biggest garage on the block, but with eBay Motors, there's 122 million parts right at your fingertips. Whatever you need, there's something that fits your vehicle. Air filters, tires, seat covers, and more. Get the right parts at the right prices. eBayMotors.com. Let's ride. Envy, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. All right. Now, it's time for a positive note, man. Well, first I want to say... Um, just rest in peace to take off again. Absolutely, man. that's all. That's it. I, I don't. I don't even. I honestly don't even have anything else to say. Cause like I've been saying all morning, there's nothing I can say that wouldn't sound like I'm not reading the same old script. But you know, cause this is just, it's just too common at this point. But the positive note is simply this, man. Anything that costs you your peace is too expensive. Breakfast club, bitches. Y'all finished or y'all done? 